according to your wish. Well, hi. I want to welcome you once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk as we continue on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. This is our fifth session. Uh, and we're still in the Beatitudes. As we go into this, before we start, I'm joined here by, once again, by my lovely wife, Alice and good evening, Mark. Good evening. And I thought we're, we're doing this live study tonight. It's uh, February 3rd. And I just thought I would take note of the fact that this is the anniversary of the death of Johannes Gutenberg, who died, I think, in, in the 1460s. He, the inventor of the printing press. And he, of course, invented the printing press to print the Bible. What was the purpose? Too bad more people don't actually read it. But that's between them and the Lord. All right, before we start, I'm going to ask Mark to lead us in a, a prayer to get things going. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word, and just thank you for being faithful to it, and faithful. We just pray that you give us your wisdom here and just let it seep into our spirit so we can apply it to our lives. Amen. Amen. Okay. As I said, we're continuing our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we're, we've been doing for the last few weeks the Beatitudes, the, the blessed are those. So where we are tonight is, or in this session is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, says filled in the King James. That's Matthew 5, 6. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 5. And I do want to remind you again, this is really an in-depth Bible study. So it would probably serve you well to take notes. If you're a note taker, if you're serious about the study, so you can spend time. You know, don't just spend this hour, but spend time in the Word, meditating on it, talking to the Lord about it throughout the week. All right? And I, I will also say, if you want, you can write to us uh, at office at BibleTalk.com and request, I make myself little notes as I'm praying, getting ready for these studies, and I'd be happy to send those to you. The other thing is, we do, as I like to say, want to encourage you to participate. Now, we can't do that interactively as we're doing this live, but you can surely write to us at office at BibleTalk.com uh, with any questions, comments, or suggestions that you have. Or Facebook. We are also We're on, on Facebook. Facebook, and I have no idea in the world how you get to that. No. But we're there, so yes, we look us up. <laughs> Actually, you can, there's Actually, a link, the link to the, on the front page of Bible Talk. There's a, a link yes, to our Facebook page right. on the front page of Bible Talk, too. I'm still um, learning this technology. Yeah. <laughs> and thank God for the technology that allows Amen. us to do this. Okay, let's get into this before I distract myself even more. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled or satisfied. Before I go further, I do want to make note of something. And this is, this is important. Um, if you happen to be using the message thing, you will definitely have a problem with this current study. Okay? Because the Word of God does not say this. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. Okay? That's not what the Word of God says. And this is why I say if you're using that, you really need to consider not using it. Because as we get into this, you will see that the words that God has chosen and what he has said is very, very important. Yeah, of course. Yeah. In verse 6, what's the key word in the whole sentence? Righteousness. Righteousness. Well, yeah. And that well, wasn't even in that verse. No, it's not in that verse. No, it's, it's not it's in that, that verse. Food, right. Eating and drinking. Well, okay. So, let, let's get into this. And that, Mark, is absolutely right. What this verse is about is not about hunger and thirst. It's not about being full. What this verse is about is righteousness. Okay. I want to read this verse from Romans chapter 5. Now, if, if, if you have time, or we'll make time, if you want to find out, really find out about righteousness, study the book of the letter, Paul's letter to the Romans. 
because that's what that entire letter is about. But in the fifth chapter, I just wanted to, to, to read a couple of verses here. In the fifth chapter of Romans, in the first verse it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Through Jesus, we have peace with God because we've been justified by faith. Now, justified, the Greek word that's used here is dikaiao. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but you don't have to be. I'll give you the Strong's word if you want. Strong's concordance is 1344. All right? Dikaiao. Now, just a couple of verses later, in verse 19, Paul says, For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. Now, the, the word righteous there is dikaias, Strong's 1342. Okay? These two words, justified and righteous, are used almost interchangeably throughout the New Testament because they both have their root in the same Greek word, which is a word for a, like a judicial hearing, a court hearing. All right? In other words, um, things are made right by the application of justice. You're justified, you're made righteous by the application of justice. What that means is it's like a, a trial. You have a trial, then there's a verdict. And then there's a carrying out of the, the execution of a sentence based on that verdict, right? The idea of a trial or, or a court of justice is more than just a literary device used in the Bible because it's used throughout the Bible. All right? And I just give you one example. God uses this over and over and over. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, this is a verse that probably most of you have heard. God says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. You know what he's saying? When he says that I have set earth, heaven and earth to witness again, they are witnesses to this word that God has spoken. So if you fail to do the make the right choice, there are witnesses, and the word says that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is confirmed. There are witnesses who are there to testify that this is the word that's been spoken by God. Now, be, being righteous is about being right with God the Father, right? Because justice has been done. There was a court case. Jesus was tried and punched by Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, who Jesus said had his authority because God the Father had given him the authority. Not because the Caesar, not because Caesar had given him the authority, but because God had given him the authority, right? So Pontius Pilate held the trial. Jesus was placed on trial. Pilate found no guilt in him and then condemned him to death. This was perfect justice because we were on trial before God. Jesus stood before Pilate, but that day we were on trial before God. Jesus, who knew no sin, stood in our place and became our sin, was found guilty of our sin, and then paid the price in full. The wages, the penalty for sin, is death. Jesus died and justice was done, and righteousness was accomplished. Got that? This is, I mean, I don't know how to, this is so important. This is the foundation of our relationship with God the Father. I just wanted to uh, say something about people who think that you become a sinner. Oh, no, no, you don't become a sinner. You, you are born yes. a sinner, right. but because they, people think that when, when babies are born, they're not sinners. Well, the people are silly. The, the fact of the matter is the Word of God, David said that he was conceived in sin. I mean, even before, even before he was born, he was conceived in sin. Uh, th this is because it's in his DNA. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? This is, this is sin. This is what the, 
what was called in theology, and you don't hear that this term a lot, original sin. It was the sin of Adam and Eve that is conveyed or passed on in the flesh through through generation after generation after generation. So we were we were conceived and born in that sin and guilty of sin even when we came out. Now that's the, that's the fact, right? But Christ, praise God, through His work has made us or yes. offers the free gift of righteousness, being right with, to anybody that will accept it. Be free from us. Because, and this is what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? And remember, the Sermon on the Mount, we talked about this in the very first couple of chapters of this, is a is a, a sermon, a teaching that Jesus gave to his disciples. Yes. This is not being spoken, although the crowds are there to listen in. This teaching is being directed to those who have accepted him and are his disciples already. Those who are righteous. Right? Those who are righteous. So, okay, okay, then if we are righteous, which was a free gift from the Father through the work of his Son, so then why do we need to hunger and thirst for it? That's a reasonable question. Yes, it is. And the answer is just as simple. Okay? This is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Jesus is teaching what righteous behavior is all about. This isn't about seeking righteousness. It's about seeking behavior that is righteous. All right? Listen, listen to this. I, and this is really important. This is, as I said, this is what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. Jesus is teaching what righteous behavior is all about when the people of God had been completely convinced that a religious behavior was what the Lord wanted from his people. He's teaching what righteous behavior is when they had begun to live a religious behavior that could not make any man right with the Father. And this is what the people of God... And I'll call it the church. This is what the Pharisees and Sadducees are saying. This is what they were teaching. They were convincing the people that God wanted a religious behavior. And now Jesus Christ has come to teach in the Sermon on the Mount what our righteous behavior is. A righteous behavior and a righteous attitude. The Sermon on the Mount is not, as so many people are teaching today, about attitudes to make you happy. But training us disciples in right behavior and right attitudes that demonstrate God's love, grace, and power in our lives. The Sermon on the Mount is not about making you righteous. Jesus already did that. It's about living that righteousness. Everything else is commentary. So, what's so important today is that you get this. If I can communicate anything, it is this. This Sermon on the Mount, and the reason I started out with this study five weeks ago, was to say how important it is, how relevant it is, because this is the definition of Christianity. The Sermon on the Mount is the definition, the defining moment of how a Christian is to live their life. And if we are not living our lives according to lining up with the Sermon on the Mount, then the question arises, are we living Christianity? And that's important yes, because I said in the beginning, this is the most radical, fanatical sermon ever preached. Well, yes, it is. But that's the, what we're supposed to be, is radical and fanatical in our commitment to Jesus Christ and our commitment to the Father. Total, complete, absolute. And we have come to condition ourselves to believe that something less than that is acceptable. It is not. So why is Jesus teaching this? It's like Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said that this is for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. It's training in righteousness. We should have this passionate, passionate desire to be living the righteousness that was the free gift of God the Father through Jesus Christ. And, and you know, what the analogy that's used here by Jesus Christ is that we should hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now the problem is, 
Here in, in our modern lives, particularly in the Western world, we don't have a clue what hunger and thirst are. No, we really don't. I, listen, I'm telling you the truth. Hunger and thirst are the most powerful driving forces known to man. But we think, well, I feel like having a quarter pounder down at McDonald's. That's not hunger. That's not hunger. I'm talking about hunger that so many millions, if not billions of people in this world experience, experience today. That they are driven to find food for today, to find water. We don't know what that's like here in the Western world. Our comfort has been, we talk about it, we, I know I hear everybody telling me how blessed we are because we have all this comfort. I don't know. Let's have that conversation a thousand years from now and see. All this comfort may be our enemy. That's right. Kind of like the rich man and Lazarus. Yeah, well, unfortunately. <laughs> we'll find out. I promise you we will find out. Okay. I, I want to read this now. Think about this when you think about hunger and thirst. Peter, and remember, we talked about this last week. Peter's there. Jesus Christ is looking at his disciples. He's looking Peter in the eye when he's saying these things, right? Peter wrote this in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. This is not about getting saved. It's about growing in respect to your salvation, your righteousness. But he says, and you know, what better analogy can you think of? Like a newborn baby longs for milk, for pure milk. This is how you should long for this righteous behavior and attitude in your life. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've never had a baby, which is probably doesn't come as a shock to anybody. All right. But I've never had with Alice. We've never had children. But I know. I don't know. I don't know how you can avoid knowing this. You know, if you've ever been on an airplane with infants, you know. If you've ever been around newborn babies, you know. They scream and they holler. They scream and they pitch a fit. Until they're satisfied. Until they get a new big screen television for the upcoming Super Bowl. Yeah. They care no. less about that. Until they get new clothes. No. That's not what drives them. What drives them is hunger and thirst. And that's what the Lord is speaking. The Spirit of God is moving through Peter to say, this is the way we should desire this righteous behavior and attitude, us living righteously in our lives. It should drive us. It should compel us. And how often, I was reading, I, I made a notice. I, I went online and looked at this. The Mayo Clinic says that most newborn babies need, not want, need to feed 8 to 12 times a day. They came out screaming. How desperately do you need the Word of God? I didn't say want. This is one case where I wish our want met our need. Because I'm telling you that you desperately need the Word of God in your life. And you need it as a constant flow. The problem is we've gone to where we don't necessarily want it that bad. Right? In the West, the vast majority of people have no concept of hunger and thirst. Being half an hour late for lunch at McDonald's is not hunger. I'm telling you. There's so, there are so many scriptures that address this. But I just I wanted to read one because it just as I was praying about this today, it just struck me remembering this. As the deer pants for water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. David was a man after God's own heart. I wish that that was all of our heart. That we just, my soul pants for you, oh God. You can't get enough. And one nice thing about food, you want to know something? You can't eat enough today that you won't need something tomorrow or want something tomorrow. Life depends on it. Ongoing life depends on it. Your ongoing life in the spirit depends on your hunger and thirst for righteousness. In most of the world, you can't just go to the tap for good, clean water. Water is another issue. I mean, 
Songs are sung about it, right? All day I face the barren ways without a trace. We're still recruiting for our choir here at the Bible study. <laughs> I don't know that. Right? Okay. Oh, you haven't heard that one? Of water, cool, clear water. I think it was Marty Robbins. That's another story. Wars have been fought all around the world for water. And one of the interesting things, one of the reasons that wars have been fought all over the world for water is water doesn't recognize territorial boundaries. It doesn't say, oh, I'm mm-hmm. here, i got to stop. That's right. And that's one of the reasons. Because I want to tell you something. God's grace has been poured out on all of the world without regard to national boundaries, okay? Alice and I, and Mark, lived in Central America. We lived out in the bush. And we lived in an area where there was no running water and no electricity. And the things that we take for granted here, I, it was such a blessing to me. I'm a New York City kid. I mean, I grew up in the city. You want water, you go to the tap. You want light, just throw a switch. You want food? It's a million places in New York City on every block to get food. Not down there. You know, in the morning, the mama would get up. We lived right next to uh, the guy who was the village chief, or that was our closest neighbor in the bush. And he had 10 kids. He and his wife, Myrtle, had 10 kids. And in the morning, you know, they wanted the, the, the kids wake up and they're hungry. They want to eat. So a couple of kids have to go out into the bush and cut wood for firewood. A couple of the kids go get the meat. A couple of the kids have to go down to the river and haul water. I mean, it's a project. And it's work to do this. Most of the world today doesn't have good water. They don't, I mean, it's like, like there. You don't take it for granted. But we seem to have gotten to a place where we're taking the word of God. We're taking our righteousness for granted. When you were talking about hunger and thirsting, and we don't, we have no concept of that here in the United States. We really don't. Huh. Well, most of us. And, most of us, yes. Yeah, and, and I was just trying to think of when people are deprived of Food and water, they act differently. Of course. They become very, you don't, you know, they're like strange mm-hmm. and they, they can't speak properly. Well, they, their thought process is all. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just trying to relate that to our spiritual. Well, it's true spiritually, absolutely. Because if you're not being If fed you're not being nourished right, spiritually, you, act you are crazy. drying up and dying spiritually. Yeah. Okay. That's a fact. But you do insane things. Again, I want to go back and say what I said in the beginning. What, what the people of God had been learning, they had been being trained that God was looking for a religious behavior and a religious attitude. And Jesus comes along and teaches this spiritual. He was looking for religion? The, describes the Pharisees. Describes the Pharisees. Did you say God was looking yeah. But they thought that God was. They, no, it was teaching him that God was, yes. When God was not looking for that. You know, he's, it, it's nice that we get together and we worship and, you know, we, we do all this, but what Jesus Christ said, where did he say this? To a woman at the well. And it was all about water, right? And he said that the coming time when God will seek those who worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not about these, all these outward trappings. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It is finding this true righteous behavior, this true righteous attitude that God is seeking. Not the religious trappings that were built up by religious organizations. I was going to ask you a question, but then I kind of found the answer. Good, okay. What's the difference in between righteousness and uh, religion? And I remember a part in the New Testament where they're, they're observing, not in the book of James, it's in the Gospels, where Jesus is observing people in the temple. And there's a Pharisee praying, and he's praying. he said he was praying to himself. Then there's a guy, a sinner in the no, back, no, 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 he's beating no, 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 his chest. No, 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 you, you, okay. you yeah, the, the, the Pharisee, he's up front, right, in front of and everybody, yeah, and he's, he's up there, and he's praying, not to himself. Water, he is, yeah. they, they were in the habit of making their prayers very, very visible, right. because they wanted to impress See people. See how religious right? I am. Meanwhile, there is a sinner way in the back, too humble to bring himself up to the front. And the, and the Pharisee is saying, oh, thank God I'm not like him. But Jesus is saying that one in the back, the humble one, recognizing his sinful nature and the grace of God, that's, our, that's supposed to be our attitude. Humility. 
This is a this when Paul talks about the conflict between the flesh and the spirit, he is talking about a, a warfare, an inner warfare that is constant between pride and humility. And this religious spirit feeds the pride because it makes it visible how quote unquote religious you are. Where true spirituality is not, you know, he he says, and we'll get it, you know, go into your when you pray, when you pray, go into your closet and pray. Pray in secret, give in secret. It's not about what people, it's not about people, it's about your relationship with your father. Righteousness is about your relationship with your father. Now, religion, even in the eyes of God, is about your relationship with man. Not with the father. Helping the widows and the orphans. That's exactly what it says in James in the first chapter. This is pure and undefiled religion in the eyes of God. Taking care of widows and orphans. That's about your relationship with people. But that's on the emphasis on the widows and orphans, not to impress your neighbor. It's not. It's, right. So, religion is our relationship with one another that is founded on our relationship with God. Not the other way around. Okay. I, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this when I was, again, when I was praying today, that we don't really understand about the, the driving force of being thirsty and, and water around the world. This is one of the big issues around the world, is good, clean water. Because most, or much of the world, up with that, much of the world does not have access to good, clean water. It's not accessible. There was a movie not, not long ago um, that many, if you haven't seen it, maybe you've heard of it, you know, the whole series that has been going on for decades with James Bond. All right, there have been so many James Bond characters from Sean Connery and right, mm -hmm. and now the guy Daniel Craig is it. And the last movie that was made of James Bond was Quantum of Solace. That's what it was, right? And they're the, the villains because they're always villains. The villains are everybody thinks that they're after the oil supply in the center. They're after the water because they understood that the water was more precious than the oil. They understood that. We need to understand that. I'll tell you what. You can go a lot longer without driving your car than you can without drinking water. I hope you don't find that out the hard way. Okay. So we, but we need to have, again, uh, when Jesus says, those who hunger and thirst, we need to have this driving force that nothing else can satisfy. That drives us to live the righteousness that God the Father gave us as a gift through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. There should be nothing more important in your life than your righteous behavior and your attitude. You're living this life. And that boils down to, again, imitating Jesus. Of course it does. And as I said, you know, I'm... Listen, I could, we could do this for, for months just on this one verse, but you, you probably wouldn't like that. But the, but the fact of the matter is that I'm making a statement. This may sound like an oversimplification. This Sermon on the Mount, it, remember, it's written to the saved. So this is not, this is not the word of the cross. Okay. Which is for the unsaved, for the unsaved right? right? And which brought us into the relationship we got, because I can't, I never will under, I don't want to, undervalue the yeah, word of the cross or yeah. downplay the word of the cross. Mm -hmm. But once you're saved, this is the teaching. And everything else in the Bible is commentary. This is the core. This is why Jesus, this is the only long sermon of Jesus Christ in the entire Bible. And our behavior, if we behaved as he lays it out here for us, that would be a witness for of the course, unsaved. Of course it is. Absolutely it is. And then he, he talks about that again. Yeah. We'll get to that. But the, the thing that troubles me so greatly about what you just said is you said, if we live this, because, we're not. because that's become commonplace, if we live. And it should be a no-brainer. No, it sh this should be, this is the guide for our lives. Right. This is the word spoken that is God-breathed to train us in righteousness. And the church looks at this, and that's our first reaction. This is radical. Oh, you know, this is this is nice, but it's it's radical. You know, it's not for today. It is it's for, for today. today. Absolutely, it is for today. We have been deceived to think that this is something other than normal Christianity. The Sermon on the Mount is normal Christianity. Unfortunately, it is not common 
Christianity. But it is normal Christianity. Please invite others to participate in the study. Please spend time on your own meditating on the, on the Sermon on the Mount and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And above all, please seek the grace of God and the power of the Spirit to live the Sermon on the Mount in your daily life. And pray for me that I do that. We need to be praying for one another. This is so uncommon. This is so anti-world. And we have been so conditioned to think, well, this is all right if we live this way. It's, there's no... You are not permitted to live any other way. Any other way is yes. sinner's behavior. Let me, I, I'm going to zoom in one minute. Zoom right? in. Uh, okay. Ready? Zoom. The Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew, from Matthew chapter 5 to the end of Matthew chapter 7. Listen to what I'm saying. There's not one single suggestion in it. This is the command of God. This is not a suggestion. This is the rule of life. If you are not living this, start with the fact that you've got to recognize that you're not living this. Then repent of the fact that you're not living this. Okay. Let's go to the next part. Okay, because what he says is, if you do this, if you hunger and thirst, you'll be blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. They shall be satisfied. Let's go back to the beginning. Huh? I was just saying you did a sermon in England on being satisfied. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was it, because the fact of the matter is, if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. nothing. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have Jesus, you have everything. That's right. And we deal with something in between all the time. Gray We're somewhere area. in between and a gray area. Between, but the fact is, there's no gray area. Yeah. Jesus said, either for me or against me. Right. I want to go back to the beginning. Dun, dun, dun. Back to the beginning. Genesis? Return your first love. Yes, back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. And as you're turning to Genesis chapter 3, let me start by saying this. Eve had everything that a woman could need. She had what it is now impossible for us to experience in this in the natural, thanks to her now. Okay? Think about this, particularly you ladies. Think about this. See if you don't get a kick out of this. <laughs> Eve had a perfect husband. Hey, that's right. <laughs> he did, yeah. Alice, on the other hand, does not. <laughs> but I'm working. Almost. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Send your cards and letters to Alice at Office Bible. Okay. She had a perfect home. Yes. No taxes, no utility bills. It's true. Adam and Eve had need of nothing. nothing. They had not a single need in their lives. Every need was met by God before he even placed them in that garden. Right? Mm -hmm. She had everything that she could possibly need just for the reaching out and taking. Then, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent came along. I'm going to start reading in Genesis 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty, more subtle, is a, a good translation, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The first thing he does is call into question the word of God. And that's what the world will always try and do with you, is call the word into question. So the woman says to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. So first he calls him into question. And then he says, it's just absolutely wrong. Well, she added a part here, or touch it. Okay, well, yeah, I don't even go there right now, right? For God knows, this is a serpent talking, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, 
and the tree was desirable to make wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, I've been involved over the years. You know, I've been around the block a couple of times. Uh, I, When I got saved, I had a, an advertising agency in New York. I have been involved in sales. I have been a national sales manager for a communication company. I have owned sales companies. I've been involved in selling and marketing for most of my adult life, even after I got saved to some degree, right? There's a thing that you learn in marketing when you truly study marketing. It's called a felt need. What? A felt need. A felt need. Uh, if you were to study marketing, as I, as I recall, one of the things, one of the examples that's used is, uh, for, for better or for worse, you can sell vitamins or you can sell aspirins. It's, it's easier to sell aspirin than it is to sell vitamins. Because when you have a headache, you know that you have a need. Vitamins are based on, well, maybe it's going to do you some good. But you don't feel the need. Right, right. So in order to market vitamins, you have to kind of create the need. Well, you don't actually, see, this is one of the things that we always learn in marketing and sales and what you did in the advertising. You try and create, you can't, and that's what Satan is trying to do here. He's creating a felt need. But a felt need is a want in disguise. Yeah. Okay? Because you don't, you don't need these things, okay? You, this is, we're talking about something you don't need, but somebody helps to stimulate or create that want, that desire for it in your life. Okay. Eve says, okay, now, why, she never focused on this tree before, apparently. I mean, she, it's like, not, yeah. it's there. She, she can look around and see everything is there for her. Just like I said, for the reaching out and taking, right? But now she looks and she says, well, the tree is good for food. It was not good for food. It was not good for food because God said, don't you eat from it. It's not a matter of how it tastes. It's not a matter of how it excites the senses. It's not a matter of it's nice and sugary and it's a... God said don't. If he said don't, it's not good for you. They found that out the hard way, right? But it was a delight to the eyes. Satan comes as an angel of light. He makes things pretty. And he will always offer that prettiness. And it was desirable to make one wise. That's what it says. This is what she saw now. Explain to me if you can. Explain to me if you will. Exactly what wisdom did she require that she didn't have. What is wisdom? Wisdom is, is, an, is an understanding of how you apply knowledge. Okay? I mean, you deal with three things. And I, I really don't want to get into this too deep. But there is, there is knowledge. Right? There is understanding. There is wisdom. You can know something and never apply it properly in your life. It takes wisdom to apply things properly. Okay? You can know things without understanding. Wisdom seems to me, to me, wisdom is kind of bringing together knowledge and understanding. Okay? What did she lack? What, what did she lack that all of a sudden all of a sudden, she is feeling that she needs this fruit. That's what Satan did. How did he do that? What do you need? Tell me what you need, right? Satan created a felt need, need, need. What do you need? Now, I'm going to tell you something. As we do this live, this is Super Bowl weekend here in 2012 in the United States of America. I'm sure that within the last few weeks, a cabillion guys, give or take a few, have walked into some kind of uh, consumer store and said, I need a big screen television. 80 inches. Yes. They do not. They want it, but I promise you, they don't need it. Part of what we have been, what, what our society, our culture is doing to us is convincing us that we have all these needs. I need three televisions in my house. I need two cars in the garage. I need this. I need... What do you need? You don't need television at all. You don't need television. You don't need no. it. You not do at not. all. Not at all. Oh, don't, don't you dare sit there and say to me, oh, no, no, no. You do not no, need it. You want it. Not. You may enjoy it. I'm not saying, listen, and I'm not saying you can't have it. 
But you need to understand it is not a need in your life. What do you need? Well, I'm telling you. Food and, food and water. That's what's a need. That's what you gotta have. You can do, you can do without, you could do without anything else, basically. You can't do without food and water. And that's how we're to feel about our righteousness. Righteousness is what we need. Righteous behavior, righteous attitude is what we need. But I'll tell you, you do need food and water. This is why God spoke to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 55. And he said, why do you spend money for what is not bread? Well, it's not food. And your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. It's not stuff. It's not stuff. How do I know that? Because in Luke chapter 12, Jesus said, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Jesus Christ came and said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. That is not about stuff. Abundant life is having a life that is filled, filled with love. Filled with peace. Filled with joy. Filled oh. Yes, I'm going to read the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do anything save accept these things and walk in the Spirit of God. It's a fruit. Oranges don't get credit for growing. The tree does. Satan comes along and he wants you to get focused on the world and the things of the world. Listen, this is what he tried with Jesus in the wilderness. Show Jesus all of the riches of the world. Said, hey, if you bow down before me, you can have all of this. Trying to get him focused on the things, right? And, and it's, again, it's, it's not so bad. Everybody else, look at how everybody else well, has this. Yes, but part of the problem is today is I, I, no, I, I know that this is what the world does. You can't, you, and you want to know something? You can't escape getting hit by it. If you go outside, you're going to see billboards, you're going to see newspaper ads, you're going to see radio or hear radio commercials, you're going to see television. You are going to be bombarded. I, I mentioned this is a Super Bowl weekend here in the United States. Companies spend millions of dollars to produce 30 and 60 second advertisements. Heard today it was $3.5 million for a 30 second spot. A new record. Three and a half million dollars to buy, to buy 30 seconds of commercial time. By the way, that does not count the production cost of no, making no, the commercials. Right. Which is the air time. Right. Yes. Which runs up into the millions. So a company is spending literally tens of millions of dollars, millions of dollars to get into your brain for 30 seconds. Don't you believe that they, that they believe that they can change your mind? What was that guy at Oh, I, I will deal with but that. But this is the same thing. I know, that we're going to get did. there. I know, we're going to get there. Okay. Because you don't know what he's talking about. But you will. All right. It's about creating these needs. wanting, Getting you to believe that this is a need in your life. I was going to say, I, it doesn't bother me that the world does it. That's what the world does. I don't expect righteous behavior from unrighteous people. I do, however, expect righteous behavior from righteous people. And the church is falling short too often in this. Here's a verse. It is one, of, I believe, one of such an abused verse. Psalm 37, verse 4 says this. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And what the implication is, or what, or what so many preachers would have you infer from that, is that if, oh, if you really like Jesus, he's going to give you all the stuff you want. He will give you the desires. Not give you the stuff that you desire, but give you new desires. No, no, no. no. What, what I'm saying is, what the, what's being taught is that he'll give you your desire. Whatever you want. He has become a genie in the, in the bottle. And if you rub him just the right way, if you have just the right kind of faith, if you say just the right words in a prayer, and you rub him just the right way, he's got to pop out like the genie and start granting your wishes. He'll give you the things that delight you. And you're right, no, he won't do that. Because those are not the things that are supposed to delight you. Listen to this. I want to talk about, you know, gold is pretty expensive today. Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. In Job chapter 22, which is a great chapter about gold. Yes. God says, if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. He's talking to Job. Mm -hmm. 
If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will become your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You got that? One more case of that. In, in Isaiah 58, where God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he's talking about the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath, if you study that, he's talking about resting in the Lord, which is something that we now know as Christians we're supposed to do every day. We're always supposed to rest in the Lord, right? But he says, if because of that, the holy day if you honor it and desist from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord. So when you start to live this righteousness, when you delight yourself in the Lord, guess what? He becomes the desire of your heart. And God will fulfill that desire. Jeremiah Oh, what a prophet was Jeremiah. In the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, God spoke through this prophet and said, I will fill the soul of the priest with abundance and my people will be satisfied with my goodness. It is the goodness of God that is supposed to satisfy us. But we have an enemy in the world. What a friend we have in Jesus. But we got an enemy out there. That serpent, right? Our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against that enemy. Have you ever heard money, money or love makes the world go round? Right? You've heard that? Yes, I've heard that. And, and I've said, well, that's, just, that's a lie from the pits. You know what makes the world go round? Discontentment. Dissatisfaction. At least since the fall. Economies are built on discontentment. You wouldn't buy stuff if somebody hadn't convinced you that what you have is not good or that you're you, you are lacking because you don't have that new 80-inch television. So you become discontent with the 50-inch television that you have. That's what they're trying to do, is get, make you unhappy with what you have. Why do you think divorce is so high in this country? That's part of it, because people are being conditioned to become discontent with their marital partners. And there's something better out there. Wars are started because of discontentment. And this is scripture. If you study 1 Peter chapter 2 and James chapter 4, here's what you're going to find. Pride leads to a sense of entitlement. Right? You deserve this. Just that, that sense of entitlement leads to discontentment. And discontentment, the word says, leads to war. Because somebody else has what you don't have and you want. So you go take it. I want to tell you that our heritage. Now that you're saved, you've been born again, then you have become born again of the Spirit of God, but Abraham is your father of your faith, right? Listen to this verse. Abraham, this is, this by the way is Genesis chapter 25 verse 8. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied. Satisfied with life and he was gathered to his people. I think the King James says he was full, right? He died. A, how many people in the world today are satisfied, are content? I'm going to tell you something. You don't find much contentment in the world today. But here's something. I, I think I've shared this here before, but I must do it again right now. To be made full, to be satisfied, all right, to be full, is not about adding stuff to your life. The word full is from an old Anglo-Saxon word, fully in. And that means to whiten. To full is to press or sap, scour cloth in a mill. This is an art of great antiquity. And mention is made of fuller's soap. And that's what the Eaton's Bible Dictionary says. It says in Malachi 3.2, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. At the transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration, it says that the Lord's raiment is said to have been white, so as no fuller on earth could white them. You see, that fuller had to do with whitening, right? But whitening is not about adding something to the garment. 
It is about removing something from the garden. Because what is, what's there in the problem is the spots, you know, the, the blemishes. And what being full is, is not adding to it, but removing that which doesn't belong there. To make us full, to make us satisfied, is not to add something to our lives, but to remove something. To remove anything that's not God. Things that are not from God. Things that God doesn't desire in your life. If you want to be satisfied, take those things out. Stop thinking about what you can add to your life and start thinking about what you can take out of your life. The things that are not of the Lord are the things that are keeping you discontent, dissatisfied in life. Go back to the Psalms, David. David was a man at the God's own heart. He said, as for me, I I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied. When I awake with thy likeness. David said, when I wake up, I'm going to be satisfied with you just looking at you with your likeness. Now, by the way, I'm just going to mention this again. The Message Bible, in that verse, yes, and that's, you can quote me on that. What does it say? And me, I plan on looking you full in the face. When I get up, I'll see your full stature, stature and live heaven on earth. Once again, that same word that was missing before is missing again. Righteousness. righteousness. And it's all about getting it here and now. Okay? Dissatisfaction doesn't just happen. It is cultivated. Mark mentioned before, and we've done studies on this many years ago, there was a man named Dr. Ernst Dichter. He's a psychologist. Um, he was born overseas. He was called the father of motivational research. He started a company called the, uh, oh gosh, something institute. It was the Color Institute and the Motivational Institute. And he did consulting work for all the major corporations in post-war America. And he was teaching them behavioral sciences, how they could convince people to become greater consumers. Because prior to that, especially coming out of the Second World War, when America had become accustomed to sacrifice for a goal, for a vision, for a purpose... Now, all of a sudden, the corporations, the businesses, they want that they want that going. So people will start spending, right? This is the age when television is coming into its own. Right? It's all about advertising. So I want to give you a quote from, from Dichter. We are now confronted with the problem of permitting the average American to feel moral even when he is flirting, even when he is spending, even when he is not saving, even when he's taking two vacations a year and buying a second or third car. One of the basic problems of this prosperity, then, is to give people the sanction and justification to enjoy it and demonstrate demonstrate the hedonistic approach to this life is moral, not an immoral one. Hedonistic means that you're devoted to the pursuit of pleasure and self-gratification. It's the desire for pleasure and the avoidance of pain. In other words, it is what Paul talked about in the last days, Lovers of self, lovers of money. It's all about you. This manifested itself in the 60s when it became the me generation. All right? But it didn't happen overnight. It's been cultivated. On another occasion, Dr. Dicta pointed out that the public's shift away from its pure and complex was enhancing the power of three major sales appeals. Desire for comfort, desire for luxury, and desire for prestige. Gosh, that sounds like back to other stuff with Eve. You know, but it's it's interesting that he recognized that he he didn't call it a Christian perspective. He talked about the problem of this Puritan Puritan, where you were satisfied. You know, what's the word of God say? Let me tell you what Paul wrote to Timothy again. Paul, he said, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. Now, I don't, I don't own an Amplified Bible. It's not a matter of fan of the Amplified Bible. But, it, it, I, and I don't know, listen, I'm being a little bit facetious. If I were writing an Amplified Bible, I would put this. If we have food and covering, a nice new car, big screen television, start steaks adding, in the you know, steaks in the freezer, the then we'll be content. Because this is what we're living. It's if we have all this stuff, then we'll be content. We have food and covering. This is what the Word of God says. We shall be content. Why? Because you got Jesus. And if Jesus isn't enough, you're never going to have enough. 
The Western church is not only discontent, it is cultivating that dissatisfaction in its members. Because the church today, I, I know I'm painting with a broad brush, and this may sound like judgment to you, but I will stand here and say this in the name of the Lord. All too many churches today have learned very well from Scripture. You know what they've learned? You can draw a crowd by playing to the flesh. If you meet their felt needs and preach this prosperity and preach how God wants you rich. Now listen to me, don't, don't get too sidetracked there. But when they preach that, all of a sudden they got a mega church. And as long as they keep preaching a message that's not difficult, they'll continue to grow that mega church. How did they learn that? Because it's in the scripture. Jesus answered the crowd and said, truly, truly, crowd. Jesus answered the crowd and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You get the stuff and you'll fill the place up. You can build the crowds by playing to the flesh. Those, by the way, are the same people Disciples, it said, who walked away from Jesus when his teaching became too difficult. You know where you'll find that? In John, the Gospel of John. You know where? 666. That's where. I'm going to tell you that the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is difficult. It is not too difficult. And you'll be blessed if you hunger and thirst for the attitudes and the behaviors that Christ has revealed in the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm going to go back to that first thing I said. God has called heaven and earth to witness against us or for us that he has set before us life and death, the blessing and the curse. We are to choose life. How do we choose life? When these people walked away from Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said to them, he looked them in the eyes, he said, what about you? Will you also go? Peter said, where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We need to be trained to hunger and thirst for righteousness. A righteous behavior and a righteous attitude that Christ reveals in the Sermon on the Mount. My desire in my own life is that I indeed come to imitate Paul more and more as he imitated Christ. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians, uh, I'm sorry, that's Philippians 4, 11 and 13, right? We have to come to this place where we learn that Christ is enough. That that's all we need. In Christ alone, I place my trust. It's a beautiful song. If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. If you have Christ, you have everything. Don't be deceived by that subtle old serpent who will come along and tell you what you need. What you need is to walk hand in hand, walk humbly with your God. That's what you need. Don't forget. Encourage others. Tell, tell, tell other people to be part of this, to join us for this Bible study. Yes. And if you want to make some comments, you have questions, you have any suggestions for this Bible study, write to us, please, at office at BibleTalk.com. We would love to hear from you. So, until our next get-together here next week, I want to pray that we would all know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that we might be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's what Paul prayed for the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 
And that's what I'm praying tonight for us. So until next time, may the Lord bless you a lot. And may he use you for the glory of his name. Great.